I'm uh, Bruce Wagner. Um, I work on a number of missions at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is a NASA center. And um, I've had many jobs there, but in the last 10 years or so, I am a mission assurance manager, which means I manage risk. So uh, the idea being is that sometimes people, when they work as a team, get the maybe get a, an idea that sounds okay, but it isn't actually okay. So having someone who's a little bit outside the process to kind of decide if that's a good idea or not is, is basically my job. And um, I have uh, been at JPL for about 40 years and uh, went to school with physics and astronomy as my degree and um, came to JPL 40 years ago and have had many, many fun jobs since then. Sure. So the Voyagers were launched in 1977, probably before most of your parents were born. And uh, their mission was to explore initially Jupiter and Saturn. But there was a unique opportunity to explore Uranus and Neptune with both or one of the spacecraft. And the uh, designers built that in kind of uh, secretly. They built that life extension into the mission so that we would have that option when the time came when we flew by Saturn. And additionally, they also realized these spacecraft could potentially leave the solar system and there was a lot of excess power. So they, they really designed them to last and they outdid themselves because we're coming up on 50 years of operations with the spacecraft. So the, uh, the spacecraft were very successful. They explored Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Um, in a single decade, and those planets and their satellites and what we learned about them changed everything we thought we understood about the solar system. I think they're the most important mission um, NASA's ever flown, potentially, in terms of the science return, because they, they literally changed what everybody thought about the system, from volcanism to magnetic fields to, to oceans under ice, ice uh, shells, things like that. It was... Um, probably the most exciting mission we have ever had. And the mission is continuing to be exciting because now we're out, we think we're beyond the heliopause, uh, which is where the sun's magnetic influence ends, kind of like leaving the solar system by one definition. But in actuality, there's still a lot of discussion about what we're seeing in interstellar space, which is that space outside the sun's uh, magnetic influence. So it's... Um, it's very exciting because the data that's being returned is still just as new and, and unique as back in the first decade of the spacecraft's lives. Okay, that's a good question. So it takes, uh, the distance between the sun and the earth is eight light minutes. So you can kind of keep that as your, your frame of reference. So Voyager 1 is about 165 times that distance away. Voyager 2 is a little behind, around 150. So to put that into perspective, you can do the math. It takes us 22 and a half hours to get a signal to Voyager 1, and then another 22 and a half hours to get the signal back. So it's almost two days for us to understand that if we send anything to the spacecraft um, to understand if it worked or not. We're, we're very starved for power at this point. We, um, we have uh, um, radioisotope thermoelectric generators. They take heat from a radioactive source and they use that heat to generate electricity for our spacecraft. And to keep our instruments on, we've had to, to do different things with the spacecraft. And one of the things we did was to go very low down in margin and we were too close to a margin when we tried to do to turn on a heater to solve another problem, the spacecraft said, I don't have enough power. And it went to a configuration that is, had not been used for many, many years. It was kind of a last ditch fail safe uh, configuration. So we have, we have programming on board called fault protection. When the spacecraft said it didn't have enough power, it went through this fault protection code and it said, I'm going to turn off the main transmitter to Earth, and I'm going to turn on this weaker transmitter. So at first, we couldn't get any signal back, but we were pretty sure what happened. And after a lot of work at our antenna sites around the world, we have, we have three sites around the, the world that track 24 hours any given spacecraft. Those antennas were configured in a specific way, and they were actually able to see this very faint signal from the other type of transmitter. So we knew the spacecraft was okay, 
And then we took a few days to make sure we had the right uh, the right commanding in place to get the spacecraft back. And we sent the commands and the spacecraft went back to its expand transmitter, which is the primary one we use. And um, there were no issues per se, um, except that our, our instruments also got misconfigured a little bit. So we had to spend another few days getting those commanded back into the proper configuration. But after that problem, the spacecraft's been sending back great data. Yes, so it's it was uh, on board because um, there's there were actually multiple ways to to listen to the Voyager data, but it had different radio transmitters, primarily for radio science. So having different frequencies of radiation passing through a planet's atmosphere um, allows you to kind of probe the atmosphere. So when Voyager flew behind a planet, they would use both both transmitters, I believe. So it was one of the planetary encounters where we last used X band. And then for a long time, we could see it. S-band uses less power on the spacecraft, but um, it, it, it's a weaker signal. So we kept it in this fault protection code for many decades. And then we knew it was too weak to really get telemetry back at this point. But rather than change the code, which is always something you don't want to do on a very old spacecraft, we just elected to keep it in there. So. Um, in the old days, maybe a few 20 years ago, something like that, S-band would have been able to give us maybe some telemetry back. But at this point, we're fo so far away that it just lets us basically see that the radio's on, but we can't get any data back. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we found a very unique feature called Pressure Front 2. Um, it's a, basically a change in the magnetic field and the density of some of the particles we see in interstellar space. We saw that in 2020, and we're still trying to puzzle out exactly what's going on with that feature. There are many theories, um, some of them conflicting, about what, the, what pressure, pressure front two is, and we're seeing that with Voyager 1. With Voyager 2, we're waiting to see if we see other evidence of, of a similar feature because it's further behind. Um, so we're really focusing Voyager 1 science on understanding pressure front 2, and Voyager 2 is looking at um, galactic cosmic rays and some of the other problems that Voyager 1 maybe is, can't be as well focused on because it's, it's really zeroed in on the pressure front 2 issue. So um, just every single day we get data back is a chance for something surprising like pressure front 2 to happen, and then over long term, you think about this data set, we've, we've had these instruments on for almost 50 years, flying continuously out from Earth, past all the planets, through the, heat, the, the outer part of the sun's magnetic field, and then into interstellar space. And having that long duration data set is just, uh, the longer we keep it going, the more valuable it is. Yeah, so I was uh, I was very interested in science when I was younger, and uh, I had uh, um, I had a small telescope. So I was an amateur astronomer when I was um, maybe 12, 14. And then when I was 14, uh, the Viking landers landed on Mars, which was really interesting seeing the data come back from that. And then about that time, the pioneers, which were ahead of the Voyagers, sent back some of the first really good pictures of the Jupiter satellites. And they were very grainy, but the promise was that Voyager was going to, you know, take pictures of all of these these spacecraft or the, these satellites. So I was interested enough in astronomy and then inspired to try to work in robotic exploration. I really wanted to work at JPL when I was 14. And I went to uh, college and all through college, these Voyager encounters kept happening. And it was... Uh, it was very inspirational, and even though I'm not that good in, in math and physics was very difficult for me, I, uh, I was constantly inspired to keep working hard and keep, keep striving for my goal. And then eventually, after I graduated, I got this amazing opportunity to come to JPL and actually participate in this stuff. So it's kind of full circle that uh, I started my career being inspired by Voyager, and I get to, to help it here at the end of the mission, so to speak. So pretty exciting.